Ja, nee, ik wilde jou vragen, maar toen dacht ik, oké, ik praat met Bojis al zeggen. Nee, 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 je toch ze kon je bolet toch aan ze bolet. Ja, is goed. Dan aan ze bolet, 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 dan aan
Okay. Oh, uh, I need my screen to be shareable. Okay, all right. Thank you. Regard for Sri Gurudev. Referring to this incident, the incident of having been accepted and blessed by Srila Gauru Kishore Das Babaji Maharaj in later years. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati commented on receiving a jerk of the lotus feet of Sri Gurudev. For the span of one year, I lost all sense of this external cosmos. I do not know whether any transcendental agent equal to him has ever appeared in this plane. How may those who are preoccupied with worldly lust, anger, and so on ever know him? And I have been busy within this temporal sphere, trying to bring sense gratification within the grasp of my hand. I often thought that by ob obtaining the objects of sensual enjoyment, all my shortcomings would be fulfilled. He's reflecting our thought process. Certainly I attained various rarely achieved goals, but my own personal deficiencies were never mitigated. In this material world, I've had the association of very high class well-born people, but noting that multiple inadequacies, I could not offer them praise. Seeing me in such a lamentable condition at such a time of adversity, the most merciful Lord Gaurasundar gave permission to his two dearest devotees, Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Srila Kaurakishwar Das Babaji, to grant their blessings to me. Because I was always intoxicated with worldly false ego, wanting to be lauded, praised again and again, I was depriving myself of my own true benefit. But due to the influence of pious activities enacted in previous births, I came in contact with Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, my spiritual well wisher. My Prabhu, uh, my master, Shila Gauruki Shodas Babaji, would often visit Shila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and stay with him. Out of compassion for others, Shila Bhaktivinoda Thakur pointed out my Prabhu, Shila Gauruki Shodas Babaji, upon seeing whom the extent of my <clears throat> worldly false ego diminished. I knew that all living entities who have taken the human form of life were fallen and low like myself. But by gradually observing <clears throat> the spiritual fiber of my master, I realized that only a Vaishnava would reside on this mortal plane and be of exemplary character. My Gurudev mercifully told me, reject your knowledge, purity, and aristocracy and come close to me. Here, purity refers to the conceptions of worldly purity that are associated with uh, the mother lok and so on. Don't go anywhere else. Whatever you require, as many rooms, houses, palaces, and mansions, as much as scholarship, skills, self-control, and renunciation, you will get. Simply come close to me. Let there be a house. Let there be an entrance. Let there be learning. Do not be enamored by this type of thinking. Do not consider as necessities that which ordinary people accept as such. I was a fearsome debater, but with great kindness, my Gurudev kicked out my pride in debating. Even in unlimited millions of lifetimes, I will not be able to find the limit of his compassion, nor will anyone else be able to do so. Although I'm unfit, He recognized me as his servant, thus fulfilling my cherished desire by which I may live forever. Furthermore, later on, when I met my preceptor, teacher, his deeds and actions gave me entire satisfaction 
as to mastering the subject I was so earnestly searching for. I became a practical man in associating myself with this great master of religious atmosphere from the day I actually met him. It was by providential dispensation that I was able to fully understand the language and practical side of devotion after I had met the practicing master and on my full submission unto him. No education could have prepared me for the good fortune of understanding my master's attitude. He's free and adept uh, expert in all movements regarding the teachings of Sri Chaitanya and Sri Man Bhagavatam. Before I met him, my impression was that the writings of devotion service, the writings of the devotion school could not be fully realized in a practical life in this world. My study of the master and then the study of the books along with the explanations by Thakur Bhaktivinoda you know, gave me ample facility to advance toward the true spiritual life. Before I met my master, I had not written anything about real religion. Up to that time, my idea of religion was confined to books and to a strict ethical life. But that sort of life was found imperfect unless I came in touch with the practical side of things. Continuing to discharge responsibilities at the yoga beat, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati did not physically associate much further with the spiritual master. <clears throat> but occasionally he crossed the Ganga to have darshan of his Gurudev and was always connected with him on the transcendental platform of service. Some years later, a gentleman attracted to the teachings of Srila Saraswati Thakur was accompanying him on a preaching tour in East Bengal. East Bengal is Bangladesh now. While they were coursing the waters from Golango to Narayan Ganj by steamer, he posited, he gave his opinion. As a Goshtyanandi, your whole way of life and outlook um, is quite different from that of your Guru Maharaj, who was a peaceful Bhajananandi. Saraswati Thakur excitedly replied, there is no disparity whatsoever in our purpose and intent. This is something that he often noted. Indicating the clanking and whirring of the boat's engine, he explained that the moving parts were dependent on the battery, which although small, silent, unmoving, and unseen, was a source of power for the whole operation. Similarly, he continued, my Guru Maharaj was sitting and chanting, and didn't mix with the public, but he is the battery for all my activity. Without him, I'm nothing. Speaking at the Samadhi of Srila Gaur Das Babaji, on 29 March 1933, Srila <clears throat> Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati revealed that his Guru Maharaj had given him three instructions, not to make any disciples, not to associate with anyone, and not to go to the world of Maya, Calcutta. Shila Bhakta Siddhanta Saraswati then affirmed about himself. He did not make disciples. Those who considered themselves as disciples were in fact as gurus, or by observing their ideal inclination for Hari Seva, his own tendency to serve increased. He did not associate with anyone. Association means to accept something from others, but he accepted only what was given by his Guru Maharaj. He never went to Calcutta but only to the Gaudiya which although ostensibly, seemingly situated in Calcutta was actually by Kuntha, without dullness, beyond the influence of Kali. Siddhanta Saraswati also likened his apparent disobedience to that of Sri Ramanuja Acharya, who had famously delivered unlimited persons by supposedly transgressing his Guru's order. Sri Ramanuja Acharya, exhibiting the pastime of one day seemingly offending the lotus feet of Goshti Puri, distributed prema to the world, even though similar dangers may arise in the present preaching activities of the Vishwavaishna of Raja Sabha. Still being possessed of tolerance like a tree, we must tolerate them. So from this, it was clear that his disobedience to the instructions of his Guru Maharaj was only superficial. In Puri, in March 1901, 
Shila Bhakti Nath Thakur and Shri Siddhanta Saraswati journeyed to Puri with the intention of settling there indefinitely to engage solely in devotional pursuits. Bhakti Vinod Thakur wanted to be in Puri because he was quite unhappy with certain developments. Uh, Mayavad had very strongly um, come up in Bengal. And Bhakti Vinod Thakur wanted to pray to Lord Chaitanya at Puri. On the way, they visited the holy places of Ramana, Bhuvaneshwar, and Sakshi Gopal, as was customary for pilgrims en route from Bengal to Puri. Soon becoming intimately acquainted with and attached to Puri Dham, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati expressed to Bhakti Vinod Thakur a deep desire to perform bhajan, that means to chant Hare Krishna mantra, near Srila Haridas Thakur Samadhi. According, accordingly, Shila Bhaktivinoda Thakur arranged for Siddhanta Saraswati to take responsibility for Archana at the adjacent Giridhari Asan, one of the Swatasan months. Originally, these months had been venues for meditation by the Saptarshis, the seven sages whose abodes are near the pole star and who always contemplate the well being of the inhabitants of the universe. Deity service was later revealed in some of these, uh, some of those marks. And a number of Lord Chaitanya's associates had lived and worshipped there. Giri Dhari Asan was the former Bhajan Kutir of Lord Chaitanya's beloved associate, <coughs> Shila Jagadananda Pandit, who there had served the deities. Shri Shri Radha Giri Dhari. Shri Siddhanta Saraswati gladly accepted the opportunity to continue the worship of deities so dear to an illustrious devotee of Lord Chaitanya. Moreover, he began giving daily lectures at Giridhari Asan. Shortly thereafter, Shila Bhaktivinoda Thakur acquired a small plot of land close to Giridhari Asan and in 1902 inaugurated construction of Bhakti Kuti, his place of bhajan, his place where he could, where he could chant. During 1903 at Bhakti Kuti, Shila Bhaktivinoda Thakur regularly had she Siddhanta Saraswati read, read and explain in his presence. She Chaitanya Tirtamrita, Govinda Bhashya, Shat Sandarbha, Srimad Bhagavatam, and the Upanishads, himself sometimes interspersing comments. These sessions attracted a group of regular listeners, including the disconsolate Maharaj of Kashim Bazar, the unhappy Maharaj of Kashim Bazar. Sri Manindra Chandra Nandi Bahadur, celebrated as the foremost patron of Vaishnava Dharma in Bengal. Maharaj Nandi was staying in a nearby tent, grieving for his recently deceased wife. Yet by hearing from this exalted duo, his lamentation and illusion were gradually dispelled. Sri Radha Raman Charan Das Babaji, an educated man, who had renounced the world to fully pursue Vaishnava Dharma, had recently organized a Kirtan group that chanted at various places in Puri. Charandas, as he was often called, regularly came to see Bhaktivinoda Thakur at Bhakti Kuti and Sri Siddhanta Saraswati at Giridhari Asan. And Sri Siddhanta Saraswati sometimes visited him. But relations later soured when Charandas introduced several concocted ideas, especially his invented mantra. Bhajanitai Gaur Radhe Shyam Japa Hare Krishna Hare Ram. Although Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Sri Siddhanta Saraswati earnestly advised Charandas to desist from the parlous deviations, from the uncertain deviation, dangerous deviations he had introduced, the Babaji refused. Incensed, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati began to rail against this fallacious practices. He began to very strongly criticize these defective practices. From 1902 to 1904, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati remained based in Puri, <clears throat> spending almost all of 1904 there. He engaged in scriptural discussions with sadhus and pundits of different sampradayas and undertook an intensive study of many philosophies, 
prominent and obscure, religious and secular, current and historical, oriental and occidental. That means Eastern and Western. He made a particularly rigorous scrutiny of Mayavad with the aim to fight it in the future. For this purpose, he frequented the Govardhan Mat, established by Sri Pad Shankaracharya, situated about 100 yards from Bhakti Kuti. Sri Madhusudan Tirtha, head of the Mat, treated Sri Siddhanta Saraswati respectfully, personally guided him in his research, and gave him free access to the extensive Mat library. In fact, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati spent so much time discussing monism with Sri Madhusudan Tirtha that some people suspected he might join the impersonalist camp. During this period, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati started collecting materials for the Vaishnava Encyclopedia that Srila Bhakti Nur Thakur and the newspaper magnate Shishir Kumar Ghosh had requested him to compile. Oh, so this is coming from Bhakti Nur Thakur. And also conducted much research into the teachings of Acharyas, Nimbarka, Ramanujan, and Madhur, comparing their philosophies to that of the Gaudiya school. We'll come across this Vaishnava Encyclopedia project. He produced only four small volumes. But a lot of work needs to be done. <clears throat> I personally think we need to set up something like our own Vaishnavapedia in which we present verifiable information about all the four Vaishnava lines and especially the Gaudiya Vaishnava line. It should become a gigantic encyclopedia of the scope that Muktivinoda Thakur Bhaktisiddhanda Sarsina would want. Last engagement in Jyotish. Although Sri Siddhanta Saraswati had practically forsaken all interest in Jyotish, his erstwhile students, his students, former students, were reluctant to forsake him. They didn't want to give him up. They felt the loss of his leadership in combating proponents of the modernized approach to astronomy, particularly the followers of Sri Babudev Shastri. For decades, Babudev had been revered as the greatest authority on Jyotisha especially after releasing in 1860 a Bengali translation of Suri Siddhanta, which had been commissioned by a Christian minister from America, specifically to interpret Vedic cosmology as compatible with the Copernican system. By thus effecting a denial of the Puranic worldview, Bapudev had collaborated in compromising Vedic culture with contemporary scientific perspectives. From 1841, he had taught both Indian and European astronomy at the Benares Sanskrit College and had published vol voluminously in Sanskrit and English, promoting knowledge of European astronomy and modernization of Indian astronomy. His pupils and intellectual science descendants dominated the astronomical scene in Benares until the end of the century, when his conclusions and techniques were challenged by Sri Siddhanta Saraswati at the Saraswata Chatushpati, at the behest of his former disciples, former pupils. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati agreed to debate with an accomplished student of the now elderly Bapudev, the subject being perspectives on astronomical precision. Thereat, on 2 January 1902 in Calcutta, with Rai Bahadur Rajendra Chandra Shastri, president of the Royal, Cha Royal Society, as the chairman, she said, Dandas Saraswati's superior learning and powerful elocution, powerful speech, left that scholar so completely trounced, so disturbed. Uh, that Sri Bapudev Shastri, his theories and reputation having been shredded, involuntarily passed to and during in the assembly. So severely defeated. Henceforth, other Jyotishis avoided debating Sri Siddhanta Saraswati for fear of humiliation. And the renowned Vice Chancellor of Calcutta University, Ashutosh Mukhopadhyay, asserted that the chair of astronomy was reserved for Sri Siddhanta Saraswati an unprecedented offer, nigh, nearly unthinkable for such a young man. Naturally, many Jyotishis urged Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to continue his astrological pursuits. Had he remained in this line, undoubtedly he would have become one of the most prominent Jyotishis in history. He had already made tremendous contributions to the discipline and the majority of regnant Jyotishis of Bengal. Reigning 
astrology, astrologers of Bengal, where either his pupils or students of his pupils, but he had more important things to do. East Bengal and South India. On the order of his Gurudev, Hilagaru Kishor Das Mahabaji, he said Dhanta Saraswati now fully focused his didactic efforts, his efforts to educate others, his efforts, his teaching efforts toward propagating the absolute truth. So he was only interested in uh, teaching the message of the Acharis on Gaudiya Vaishnava Siddhanta. To further prepare himself for this task, he continued his study of various sampradayas, traveling widely to collect sundry, several details about the history, practices, and philosophies of diverse religious groups, and to locate and acquire as many relevant books and manuscripts as possible. In January 1904, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati visited Sita Kund, Chandranath, and other religious centers in East Bengal. In January 1905, he embarked on a tour of South India accompanied by Sri Rajendra Kumar Vidya Bhushan, an old acquaintance widely known in Bengal as a Mayavadi scholar. Together, they went to numerous important holy places, <clears throat> especially those visited previously by Lord Chaitanya. These included Udupi, the seat of the Madhva sect, Srirangam, the principal spiritual hub for the followers of Sripad Ramanuja, Sringeri, the southern headquarters of the original Shankara Sampradaya, and Simhachalam, Tirupati, Kanjivaram, famous Kanchipuram, Kumbhakonam, Madurai, and many others. Wherever he went, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati met religious dignitaries and intellectuals and entered into learned exchanges with them. Yet in Sringeri, the discipular, disciplic, Descendants of Sri Pad Shankaracharya were unwilling to discuss with Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, possibly because of his not being of Brahman caste, or because they considered the Gaudiyas an unorthodox sampradaya, and thus unworthy of disputation. At Sri Pad Ramanujacharya's birthplace, Sri Parambudu, he gathered information from resident sannyasis about Vaishnava Tridanda Sanya, as practiced both in their line and previously in that of Vishnu Swami. In fact, Sridhar Swami, as a true follower of Vishnu Swami, in his Bhagavatam commentary, talks about Tridandi Sanya. Let's not talk about Ekadanda Sanya. At the famous temples of Shiva in Kanjivaram and of Meenakshi, the form of Durga in Madurai, the priests were surprised to see Sri Siddhanta Saraswati conspicuous, prominent, as a Vaishnava by Stilak, enter for Darshan. Those priests were inheritors of an ancient contention with Sri Vaishnavas, who on principle never went near demigod temples. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati explained that as a follower of Lord Chaitanya, he entered temples of demigods to offer them respect as prominent Vaishnavas, not as independent gods. Rivaratthaya Dhyaya they are meant to be accepted as subordinate family members um, of Lord Vishnu. Deputation to Mayapur. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati returned to Calcutta from his long and laborious journey, invigorated, vibrant with fresh hope, and simmering with new ideas. Now he was equipped with both a large collection of rare books and manuscripts and comprehensive knowledge of multifarious doctrines and philosophies the likes of either of which most scholars could not expect to amass in a lifetime. His erudition, his learning and intellect was so extraordinary that upon listening to him elucidate Vaishnava teachings, one Dr. Atal Bihari Maitra, a retired deputy magistrate and an accomplished student of philosophy became so impressed that he approached Hilabhaktino Thakur to offer respect exclaiming that the Thakur must be certainly must certainly be a worthy man because Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was subservient to him. But Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's acquisition of knowledge had not been merely academic. His aim was to employ this arsenal of information. He, all of this information was uh, ammunition 
these are weapons to be used in the intellectual war against um, Mayavad as well as other anti Vaishnava doctrines. This is why we study. If you are not interested in this, then you should not be studying all the previous Acharya's books and learning Sanskrit and doing, you should just do what is badly required and preach to the common mass. And for that, whatever little bit is required, that's enough. But if you want to preach to the, the class, then you'll have to uh, get into this track, which involves a lot of intellectual hard work. And Dr. Siddhanta Sarsitaka himself, he demonstrated this. His aim was to employ this arsenal of information in a systematic, sustained onslaught against impersonalism and subsidiary obfuscations, perversions of genuine dharma, and ultimately to establish the superlative position of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's Prema Siddhanta. No Chaitanya's conclusions on love of Krishna. On returning to Puri, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati again took issue with Charan Das Babaji and his group for that mutative presentation of bhakti for his for changing the Lord's teachings on bhakti. This was becoming a major controversy with the sway of public opinion going against Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. Considered presumptuous and offensive for his assaults on a famous and respected guru of thousands. Some of Charandas's followers attempted to terminate Siddhanta Saraswati's service at Giridhari Asan by drumming up accusations against him, which he coolly ignored. Charandas had continued to frequent Siddhanta Saraswati's Sri Chaitanya Chaitanya readings at Bhakti Kuti. But when one day a discussion arose on the topic of Charandas's invented mantra, Siddhanta Saraswati spoke so strongly that Charandas snapped ties with him. If you examine this, you see that Charandas, uh, certainly his behavior gives the impression that he was all loving, all accommodating. And Siddhanta Saraswati is just being so finicky and picky about one small thing. But it's not one small thing. It is a big thing. You're not authorized to change. If you change, then you're going to increase the number of people who will develop perverted misconceptions and you're delaying their um, possible attainment of uh, the perfection of love of Godhead. You're just making it more difficult for people to come back to Lord Chaitanya's so to speak in the proper manner. So she says, Danda Saraswati was not um, disoriented by how you deal with him. You know, there are some people, not some people, many people, we have a tendency that if someone deals with me, yeah, you know, and someone deals with us nicely, then immediately we form a very favorable opinion of him. We set aside his philosophical deviations and so on. But this is the Saraswati, the true Brahmana. It's not like that. No consideration of how sweet you deal with him and so on. You're doing something which is harming the whole world. At least the world of devotees of Lord Chaitanya who want to attain the highest perfection of life. You're misleading. That should be stopped. And that is the key point. Everything else is just courtesy, and that is not very important. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati then started going door to door and even catching pedestrians on the street, denouncing that Upper Siddhanta. But many people responded by insulting and pushing him. And when some of Charandas's acolytes, um, assistants, threatened Sri Siddhanta Saraswati with death, Lavatuna Thakur, although fully in accord with the spirit of his outspoken son, ordered him to go to Mayapur. Shilavatuna Thakur had anyway wanted Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to again oversee the Yoga Peak temple, where due to lack of supervision, everything was in a shambles. Everything was in shambles. Even by offering payment, it was hard to get anyone to serve in such a remote and undeveloped place. And most of those who could be persuaded to stay, even if only temporarily, were of questionable behavior or downright unruly. 
On top of this difficulty was harassment from the envious Casco Swamis residing across the river in Pulia. Pulia is now a deep town. Thus, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati felt more inclined to remain in inclusive, in reclusive bhajan without taking charge of the yoga people. But Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur goaded him. Do you want to abandon the world neglecting service to Mahaprabhu? Such avoidance of responsibility would be like the renunciation of the Mayavadis. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati acquiesced, agreed, finally. A billion names. During 1905, at age 31, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati took a vow to chant daily at least 3 lakh holy names and monthly at least 10 million until he had chanted 1 billion names. He chanted on a Jabamala given by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, who had himself used them to fulfill a vow of chanting a billion holy names. So now this is 1905. Hmm. That means Bhaktivinoda Thakur also would have chanted a lot to come to the point of one billion holy names. Um, I'll do the calculation later on. But uh, it looks like Bhaktivinoda Thakur himself had chanted a lot. Obviously, he would have chanted a bare minimum of 64 rounds, Lord Chaitanya standard. But uh, it looks like he also had chanted a lot. Shri Siddhanta Saraswati Shapta Koti Nama Yajya. The sacrifice of chanting one billion holy names. Um, which he performed before a deity of Lord Chaitanya lasted just over nine years and four months and was punctuated by much struggle and several colorful incidents, including attempts to oust, throw him out from Mayapur. Yet he was determined to continue service there no matter what. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati cleared an overgrown area at the Yoga Beat and made a grass hut, in which he lived from 1905 to 1909 amidst his many books and manuscripts, in accord with Alankar Shastra describing green as expressive of virahabhav, he preferred to use green items, for instance, wearing a green shawl in winter and writing with green ink. He wore only plain and stitched cloth on both his upper and lower body, using neither shirts nor sweaters, and gave up footwear, even though his feet would bleed. Once daily, he cooked plain rice in a clay pot, and ate nothing more. He slept minimally on the earthen floor of his hut, bathed in the Ganga, and the rest of the time chanted day and night on the same beads Bhaktivinoda Thakur had given him in childhood, which he used uh, throughout his sojourn in this world. Occasionally, he took black pepper to offset the nausea caused by his virtual fasting. In the heat of summer, he would close the door and go on chanting all day and night. Whenever rain leaked through the roof patch, he sat under an umbrella and continued chanting. Like Gaurakishwar Das Babaji Maharaj remarked, I see the renunciation of Sri Rupa Raghunath manifest in my Prabhu. In Gaurakishwar Das Babaji would often refer to Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati as my Prabhu, my master. Uh, Sri Rupa Raghunath referred to, she re refers to Sri Rupa Goswami and Sri Raghunath Das Goswami. Even while executing his vow, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati also managed the affairs at the Yoga Peak, wrote extensively, including an elaborate commentary on Sri Chaitanya Charitamrita completed in 1916, and spoke at length to the occasional visitors who took the trouble to approach that remote spot. 192 rounds, the Prabhupada um, said uh, that uh, Haridas Thakur took 16 hours to chant 192 rounds per day. And this was when Haridas Thakur was preaching. Haridas Thakur was not chanting 192 rounds per day when he was uh, 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 retired later on. That he must have chanted a lot more. But this was when he was preaching. Similarly, here we can see Shri Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasidhava also chanting. And he was doing all kinds of various services. Despite living as an eremite, a recluse, a hermit. The Siddhanta Saraswati was gradually becoming known as an extraordinary ascetic scholar and an uncompromising exponent of devotional precepts. 
Mysore's reputation spread. Pandits came from as far away as Puri and Vrindavan to seek his elucidation of philosophical points. And among those who came to inquire from him, several young men found themselves compelled to surrender at his lotus feet. Some of these early disciples remained in secular life. And a few gave up all other engagements to live with him full time. Past times with Sri Gurudev. In 1906, Siddhartha Saraswati was lecturing in Kulia, Navadip town, on the three grades of devotees. Kanishtha, Neophyte, Madhyama, Intermediate, and Uttama, Topmost. Having dilated, having uh, clarified, having expanded on the first two categories with reference to the appropriate verses in Srimad Bhagavatam, he then quoted the corresponding shloka describing an Uttama Adhikari. Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur, he has used the expression Uttama Adhikari interchangeably with Uttama Bhagavat, Uttama Bhakta, Uttama Vaishnava. So here also we see that. Prabhupada of Andrasar. Sarva Bhute Shriyah Pashyed Bhagavat Bhavam Atmanaharan. Bhutani Bhagavat Yatman Yesha Bhagavat Uttamaha. The most advanced devotee sees within everything the soul of all souls, the supreme personality of God at Sri Krishna. Consequently, he systematically sees everything in relation to the Supreme Lord and understands that everything that exists is eternally situated within the Lord. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati continued, What more shall I do to explain this stanza? My Gurudev, the personified manifestation of the statement, presently resides here among us in Kuliya. Anyone competent to study his character will be able to appreciate the meaning of Uttam. Just then, impelled by the Lord dwelling in the heart, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati turned and beheld the spiritual master among the listeners. Thought up to that point, though up to that point, he had been unaware of his Gurudev's presence. Thereupon, Babaji Maharaj immediately left the assembly, not wanting to hear praise of himself. Now and then, she said, Dandha Saraswati sent fruits and vegetables grown in Mayapur to Srila Gauruki Shodas Babaji, who would accept them with great adoration, touch them to his head and chest, and in due time offer them to Sri Nityananda Prabhu and partake of his remnants. A Brahmin youth from Calcutta named Mitra, although from a well to do background, once arrived at the Yoga Beat, dressed in only a tattered and grubby cloth that covered only his loins and thighs. Dirty cloth. Seeking a guru who fit his ideal of complete renunciation. Um, he spent a few days discussing deeply with Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, but left in disgust upon beholding the latter's absorption in managing the estate of the yoga beat and arranging for extra properties. Convinced that he had nothing to gain from Siddhanta Saraswati, Mitra set out for Kulia to see what he could get from Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's guru, famed as the greatest renunciate of that time. Gradually, that youth became the foremost of Hilagaur Kishore Das Babaji's assistants. But as his responsibility grew, so too did his ego. Happens all the time. And he became so conceited, proud, and bossy that whenever Sri Siddhanta Saraswati came for darshan of Babaji Maharaj, Mitra refused him entrance and closed the door on him leaving Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to simply offer Dandavat to his Gurudev from outside. Mitra appointed himself as the custodian of the plentiful milk products and other rich foods offered to Babaji Maharaj, disobeying his order to not accept them, assuring donors that he had given their offerings to Babaji Maharaj. Mitra would himself devour them. Fortified by such nutrition, he spent his nights enjoying others' wives. One day, while Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was visiting, Babaji Maharaj scolded another for desiring to touch his lotus feet, after which he called Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to his side and in Mitra's presence voluntarily took his own food dust and smeared it on Saraswati's head. In humility, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, believing himself out of favor, considered this bestowal of food dust a sarcastic masquerade to underline his severe offensiveness. A few days later, Babaji Maharaj decided to shift residence to an outhouse of a Kulia Dharmashala, which Mitra arranged to be thoroughly cleaned. 
about six months later when shri siddhanta saraswati again came for darshan of his gurudev mitra came out of the latrine he was occupying adjacent to baba ji maharaj and told shri siddhanta saraswati that he shri siddhanta saraswati would not be allowed into baba ji maharaj's presence shri siddhanta saraswati replied that at least baba ji maharaj should be informed of his arrival recognizing siddhanta saraswati's voice baba ji maharaj emerged from his privy and told him go bring bhakti vinod prabhu from the world of kali to godram people are attacking me with their annoying talk he said danda saraswati respectfully inquired are you testing me if the good fortune that i received as the dust from your lotus feet on my head is continuing then i will not be deluded by your deceptive pastimes he said that shri bhaktivinod thakur does not for a moment reside anywhere else but shri radha kund or that you reside any reside elsewhere than shri radha kund that you have entered a latrine is simply your pastime to apprise of their own situation those who desire the excreta of money women and prestige in other words shri gaurakishor das ji was simply teaching that people who are interested in money women and prestige they are actually hankering for stool despite observing you in the stool house i shall never be deprived of the dust from your lotus feet baba ji maharaj responded Yes, yes. I know that Bhakti Vinod Prabhu and yourself are directly Nityananda Prabhu. All your activities are according to Mahaprabhu's desire. How can insignificant people comprehend you? He then recounted how he had discovered Mitra to be a philanderer, an epicure. He was a womanizer, and he was a sense enjoyer, interested in eating and drinking, and turning to Mitra. advised him to go home get a job and end his hypocrisy although returning to secular life was most humiliating even for a show bottle renunciant which possibly was why so many pseudo renunciants maintained their sharan the hapless youth actually followed baba ji maharaj's sage advice his ideals having been consumed by false pride and offensiveness so this man mitra he actually um, though he was unfortunate he actually followed baba ji maharaj's instruction and he stayed outside uh, tried to follow baba ji maharaj's instruction shri siddhanta saraswati maintained that he had no relationship with the several such hangers on there were several people hanging on um gaurakishor das baba ji maharaj who considered themselves disciples or associates of baba ji maharaj but had never understood his actual glories or indeed anything about gaudi vaishnavas in february 1909 he sat on the saraswati built a small brick cottage at the location of the house of shri chandrashekar acharya an uncle of lord chaitanya situated about a quarter mile north of the yoga peet this area was later revealed by shri siddhanta saraswati as brajapattana the town of braja as discovered by him there where lord chaitanya had performed dramas of krishna's brajalila in this spot shri siddhanta saraswati remained absorbed in bhajan visualizing it as non different from the bank of radha kund the bali ghai showdown even while executing his vow shri siddhanta saraswati occasionally went outside mayapur for preaching especially to attack the apasampradayas for misleading people with their bogus interpretations and practices He particularly agitated the smart Brahmins and Jat Gosai. Jat Gosai is a caste Goswami by insisting that the position of a Brahmana and post of Guru are not hereditary professions. Such assertions were intolerable to the smart Brahmins and Jat Gosai, who were keeping a stranglehold on Hinduism in Bengal. They had control over the Hindus in Bengal by maintaining that only persons born into families of supposed Brahmanical lineage could be counted as genuine Brahmins or Gurus, and who were not at all happy with these new ideas that contested their nine nearly unquestioned authority and threatened to despoil their ancestral business of cheating. They threatened to um, put a violent end to their. cheating business which you know their predecessors had been doing and which they were very faithfully and respectfully continuing 
although still secure with the support of mass mesonism. Misonism, Merriam Webster, a hatred, fear, or intolerance of innovation or change. Although still secure with the support of mass fear of change, born of centuries of ingrained tradition, the false Brahmins felt themselves under increasing pressure and hence marshaled themselves to protect their interests. So they got together to protect their interests. In August 1911, Suspending their mutual mistrust, the Smartha Brahmins and Kasko Swamis arranged a meeting at Sujangar village in Midnapur district of Bengal. Under the chairmanship of Sri Bibhan Bihari Goswami, they declared their anti devotional manifesto, soon thereafter published as Purva Pakshin Nirasani, refutal of the opposing argument. Bibhan Bihari Goswami was the Diksha Guru of Bhakti and was born in a Brahmin family. A Vaishnava is disqualified from worshipping Shalagram Shila and conferring initiation. By accepting disciples, Narutam Das Thakur and Shamananda Prabhu had thus contravened Shastra. They had opposed Shastra. Chaitanya Mahaprabhu presented Raghunath Das Goswami with the Govardhan Shila because as a Shudra, he was disqualified from Shalagram Shila worship. Worship of Govardhan Shila has no Shastriya basis, no scriptural basis. And hence, it's merely conventional or sentimental. Only those injunctions of Hari Bhakti Vilas that do not contradict traditional smritis are to be followed. So these were the opinions of that Brahman group, Yasko Swami group. As intended, this broadside, this fierce verbal attack, um, against Hari Bhakti Vilas, this attack on Hari Bhakti Vilas, and the conclusions of hallowed acharyas, sacred acharyas, caused much disturbance and doubt, particularly in the minds of the many Vaishnavas in the locality of the convention, whose Guru's teachings were the targeted Purva Paksha. Um, Purva Paksha means the views of the opponent, and they are meant to be stated before you refute them, therefore, they are called Purva. The preliminary, um, the preliminary position. Yet the gauntlet that had been thrown down was not merely a local matter. So the challenge that had been um, issued was not only of local relevance, its reverberations resounded throughout the Vaishnava community of Bengal in Orissa. Its uh, claims um, echoed all the way through the Bengali and Oriya Vaishnava community. In response, the proponents of pure Vaishnavism formed the Gaudiya Vaishnava Dharma Samrakshini Sabha, assembly of protectors of Gaudiya Vaishnavism under the chairmanship of Sri Vishwamarananda Dev Goswami, head of the Shyamanandi sect. The, those who were initiated followers, those who were followers through initiation, from Sri Shamananda Goswami, Shamananda Prabhu, are known as Shamanandis. They have a particular type of tilak. That is a, that is a subgroup within the Gaudiya Vishnu line. And shortly thereafter, convened another assembly to discuss the same issues in a different light to rebut the insufferable statements, to um, disprove these intolerable statements that had been made and simultaneously to reassure that discombobulated disciples, the confused disciples, of the validity of the Vaishnava position. What had happened was this 
right up by the Casco Swamis had created quite a bit of confusion amongst the uh, Vaishnavas of the Shavanandi line and others. Um, notice here. By accepting disciples, Narananda, Stakura, and Shavanandi, who had this Ganakin Shastra. So these are all very cardinal teachings. Uh, Haribhakti Vilas is coming from Gopal Bhatta Goswami and Sanatan Goswami. Sanatan Goswami wrote a commentary on it. If you don't accept Haribhakti Vilas's authority, can you seriously call yourself a Gaudiya Vaishnava? If you don't accept the authority of the six Goswamis, what kind of uh, follower of Lord Chaitanya are you? So people were confused. <clears throat> and that had to be dealt with. The three-day public event beginning on 8 September 1911 in the village of Baligai Udhavpur, close to Sujangar, was organized by Sri Bad Bhakti Tirtha Thakur, a disciple of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur, and was sponsored by the Maharaj of Mayur Bhanj, whose family traditionally had ruled on behalf and as disciples of the Shamanandi Gurus. Shri Bhaktivinoda Thakur was expected to be the main speaker, but due to severe rheumatism, was unable to attend. In frustration, he cried out, is there no one in the Vaishnava world who can reply to these people and by presenting scriptural evidence and logic, put a stop to their lowly activities? Taking up the challenge, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati penned a manuscript entitled Brahman O Vaishnavir Taratamya Vishayak Siddhanta. Conclusion concerning the comparison of Brahmins and Vaishnavas. Conclusion on the gradation between the Brahmanas and Vaishnavas. The Brahmins considered Vaishnavas to be lower than them. Whereas the Vaishnavas following Vishwamara and the Deva Goswami, they were saying, no, the Brahmins are inferior to them. So you need to point out which is higher, which is lower. This, Brahm, this was later published in Bengali as Brahman or Vaishnav. A Brahman and a Vaishnav. And uh, it is still in print. That's an important book, actually. It's a good book to study. Shila Bhaktino Thakur had been in such pain that he was unable to rise from bed. But when Sri Siddhanta Saraswati read this essay to him, he spontaneously sat up and joyfully congratulated Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, declaring confidently that by such arguments, the darkness of the Smartha doctrine would soon be dissipated. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati sallied forth. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, he... Um, went forth with the okay with full confidence of a swashbuckler uh, wait. A person who engages in daring adventures with flamboyance. Uh, marching to battle. So it's very clear that Bhakti Siddhartha Sarsitaku was very uh, confident and clear, not at all indecisive, uh, not insecure at all. Upon arrival, he was accorded a reception befitting an Acharya by Sri Madhusudan Goswami of the Radharaman temple in Vrindavan, and Sri Vishwambharananda Dev Goswami, themselves ancestral gurus, and other respectable and learned Vaishnavas. Sri Vishwambharananda Dev was from a lineage that was originally Kayastha, whose members several generations before had unilaterally undertaken the role of Brahmins and Acharyas, and were accepted thus by all 
albeit begrudgingly by many real Brahmins. Despite their hereditarily acquired status as gurus, these two renowned Vaishnava scholars upheld the Shastriya understanding that a person should be recognized as a Brahmana, Vaishnava, or Guru according to his qualities rather than merely by birth. It is by guna karma you recognize a person as a Brahmana, a Vaishnava, or a Guru. It is not by birth, it is not by accreditation and so on. Uh, it is by guna karma. It is by spiritual accomplishment. A person is recognized as a Brahmana, recognized as a Vaishnava, is recognized as an Acharya. The upcoming meeting was primarily meant to address the newly implanted doubts about this topic among the many disciples of Sri Madhusudan Goswami and Sri Vishwamarananda Dev in the area. Since trouble was anticipated, the inquisitive crowds that had gathered for the function were overseen by a large deployment of police. So there's a, a, a lot of police who have been assigned the role of keeping law and order. The day after he arrived, she Siddhanta Saraswati accompanied Sri Madhusudan Goswami and she Vishwamarananda Dev in inspecting arrangements for the meeting. All the Smartha Pandits and Jat Goswamis had, had not been invited. A considerable number had arrived from all over Bengal. And upon perceiving little capable resistance in the Vaishnava encampment, they were swaggering about. They were um, overconfident in peremptory good spirits. Uh, they were um, demanding that they be respected. They were in good spirits, thinking that they are definitely going to win. On Madhusudan and Vishmarananda's advice, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati for the time being kept aloof and avoided entering into parley, avoided entering into a fight with the opposition. He didn't want to uh, begin a debate or a discussion on the advice of Sri Madhusudan and Sri Vishwambarananda Dev Goswami. Next day, with the acquiescence of all, with the permission of all, approval of all, Vishwambarananda Dev Goswami accepted the chair of the meeting. Although Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was the youngest delegate present, his reputation was such that it was clear he should be the first to speak. Repeating the conclusions of his essay, he began by citing numerous scriptural references in approbation of Brahmanas, in praise of Brahmanas. This delighted his antagonists, most of whom were unaware of many of the passages he quoted, but their glee turned to wrath when Sri Siddhanta Saraswati shifted tack to compellingly refute the smarta position with this unerring logic and mastery of scriptural law, scriptural wisdom, presenting overwhelming evidence for asserting who is actually, for ascertaining who is actually a Brahmana or Vaishnava and asserting that only a Vaishnava is a true, true Brahman, superior to those who claim Brahmanhood by birth and that Vaishnava should be gurus or similarly produced Brahmanas, not vice versa, becoming perhaps the first ever to challenge the Brahmins to prove the purity of their descent on which they claimed superiority, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati gave compelling reasons to suggest that their bloodlines could not be wholly unsullied. He gave some reasons to point out that their generations were contaminated. The obstreperous, the noisy Brahmins responded with an uproar, squawking, um, with a loud and harsh noise and gesticulating um, using various gestures, but were requested by Sri Madhusudan Goswami to keep the peace and for now just listen, being promised an opportunity to reply. Subsequent speakers cited profusely from scripture to verify Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's points, particularly emphasizing that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu had defied, had defied caste rigidity by accepting devotees on their spiritual merit not by birth. It was he who had recognized Muslim-born Haridas Thakur as the Acharya of the Holy Name. He who had inducted the apparent Shudra, Ramanandarai, to ostensibly teach him about Krishna. 
to seemingly teach him about Krishna. And he who had made the rejected Brahmins, Rupa and Sanatan, doyans, uh, masters of the Gaudiyas for all time, the most respected leaders. Yet in the name of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, the so-called Goswamis were claiming ascendancy on the basis of birth at the conclusion of the first day. And on the second, the uninvited Smartha constituency was allowed to speak. The meeting climaxed with a two-hour allocation. Allocation. A two-hour formal speech by Sri Siddhanta Saraswati, which recapitulated, which again summarized the genuine Vaishnava position, left the rivals with nothing further to say. As the Smarthas and Jatko signs slinked away, as they um, uh, went away, slink to move smoothly and quietly with gliding steps in a stealthy or sensuous manner. So as they escaped away, Vishmarananda Dev Goswami affirmed Sri Siddhanta Saraswati as the champion of the meeting, a conclusion echoed by thousands of cheering mouths, expressing awe at the erudition of Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. Madhusudan Goswami declared him an avatar of Shukadeva Goswami and later conveyed deep gratitude to Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur for preparing a mighty Acharya in the personage of Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. This first of Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's major public triumphs was signaled by jubilant crowds rushing to take dust from his lotus feet. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati never allowed anyone even to touch his feet, let alone take dust from him. Despite, but despite his resolve to maintain a humble demeanor, a humble position, a swell of people, a group of people, uh, an increasing number of people were now crushing in on him, equally determined to get his precious foot dust. The guards pacified the clamoring throngs. The guards pacified the crowds which were shouting about. Took Sri Siddhanta Saraswati aside and washed his feet. After adding several extra pots of water to the foot wash, they distributed it to the eager mass. And fearing attempts to harm him, they placed Sri Siddhanta Saraswati under police protection. Upholding Gaur Bhajan, stung to that the whole assembly of accomplished pundits, some of whom were established scriptural authorities, had suddenly been overturned and humiliated by this lower caste upstart. The unnerved Smartha cart cartel felt compelled to stop the rising influence of pure Vaishnava Dharma as propagated by Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. So these uh, Smartha Brahmins they had uh, lost their courage. And this uh, association of Svartha Brahmins, they wanted to do something to stop Bhakti Vinod Thakur and his vocal agent, Siddhanta Saraswati, from going on with their propaganda. A challenge that Lord Chaitanya was not an avatar of the Supreme Lord, but according to his own admission, a devotee of the Supreme Lord, that he was not mentioned in the original Vedas and that the Gaur Mantras imparted by Gaudiya Gurus at initiation were not from Shastra, but a recent innovation. Because in traditional Vedic culture, everything a person does and says, and especially any philosophy expounds, must be based on and justifiable according to Shastra and the example and precept of previous Acharyas. This fresh assault was even more insidious. It was even more um, harmful than the previous one, for it struck at the very substance of Gaudi ontology. Ontology means <clears throat> a study of what exists. In philosophy, we refer to it as, in Gaudi version of philosophy, we refer to it as Sambandha, knowledge of one's relationship with the Supreme Law. This is done, Sarfi Tagore referred to it as reference. Everything has a reference to Krishna. Everything is related to Krishna. So everything has a reference to Krishna. Now, it is one of the chief uh, teachings of our predecessor Acharyas that Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is none other than Krishna himself. Not just a great devotee. 
No, he's not even just a Shakti Abhish incarnation. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead. He's not a Jiva. He is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna himself. So now that uh, this was attacked, this teaching was under attack, uh, it had to be dealt with. The smartest were confident that by establishing that Lord Chaitanya was not referred to in Shastra, they would repudiate they would refute, they would invalidate the authenticity of Gaudiya Vaishnavism and thus continue unimpeded their materialistic version of Vedic Dharma. But in another showdown, but in, in another place, um, in another confrontation, before the end of 1911 at Bodo Akhra, Navadip, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati upheld with quotations from the Upanishads, Tantra and Puranas, the Vedic conclusion, that Lord Chaitanya is the Supreme Personality of Godhead, unknown to Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. Sila Gaurakishore Das Babaji was present in a corner of the gathering and was extremely satisfied to hear his disciples' irrefutable speech. The meeting ended with prolonged applause for Sri Siddhanta Saraswati. Again, the opposition had been silenced. Both of these topics, eligibility for Brahmanhood and Guruship, and the divinity of Lord Chaitanya had been simmering controversies for several hundred years by unequivocally distinguishing the conclusive understanding from mere very similitudes, from superficial similarities. Very similitude. From very similitude, the appearance of being true or real. From Superficial appearances. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati widely established, especially in Bengal, that a Vaishnava from any background may be recognized as a Brahmana or Guru, and the Lord Chaitanya is indeed the Supreme Personality of Godhead. The Bengal has always been a tough nut to crack. Um, highly intellectual group, um, very argumentative, and unless you are sufficiently strong and vichar, achar, prachar, you cannot convince the more intelligent amongst the Bengalis to accept Krishna consciousness as presented by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. That is why uh, Acharyas like Prabhupada, Prasiddhanta Saraswati, Sachidananda Bhakti Vinod Thakur have been sent. You know, Prasiddhanta Saraswati, who became widely established as a new and sensational proponent of the supremacy of Lord Chaitanya and of his genuine teachings. Still, not everyone accepted his line. And throughout Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati's life, he would be quizzed and challenged on these issues, especially regarding the relative status of Brahmanas and Vaishnava. First, Kashin Bazar Sammilani. First meeting at Kashin Bazar. In March 1912, Maharaj Manindra Chandra Nandi invited Shila Gauri Kishor Das Babaji to attend the Kashim Bazar Sammilani, a forum arranged in his palace for presentation of devotional topics. Babaji Maharaj replied, I'm not a gifted speaker and without first getting Mahaprabhu's permission, I'm unwilling to address any such meeting. Better you request Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to participate. Maharaj Nandi was famed for his philanthropy, which extended over multiple fields, education, music, literature, agriculture, and industry. Yet he was particularly known as a patron of Gaudiya Vaishnavism for donating abundantly to promote the teaching and popularizing of Vaishnava scripture. Gaudiya Vaishnava scripture. For circulating and preserving Vaishnava literature and for maintaining Vaishnava holy places and establishing there in ashrams for sick and destitute Vaishnavas for Vaishnavas who uh, were extremely poor by his intervention. The Calcutta Sanskrit Association included Vaishnava philosophy and literature in their syllabus and introduced the conferring of the titles Bhakti Tirtha and Rasa Tirtha in admiration of his accomplishments. Elite groups and Vaishnavas from all over India awarded him such titles as Gaud Rajarshi, 
the saintly king of Bengal, Bharata Dharma Bhushan, ornament of Indian Dharma, Bhakti Sindhu, ocean of devotion, and Vidya Ranjani, one whose pleasure is knowledge. Nonetheless, his sacrifice was misdirected, being very simple hearted, sentimental, and obsequiously humble. Um, extremely, you can say, over humble. Maharaj Nandi was unable to discriminate between real and corrupt Vaishnava dharma. And being overawed by the elitism of the Casco Swamis, he remained blindly obedient to and wholly exploited by them. On arriving in Kashim Bazar, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati found himself surrounded by the very charlatans, the, the very people he was sworn to attack. Charlatan, a person falsely claiming to have a special knowledge or skill. He was surrounded by those very same dupe that he was sworn to attack, who already feared him and were not inclined to again be upstaged by him. Sri Ananta Vasu, a college student present, commented, I heard that from 22 March till 25th March 1912, the third sitting of the Kashim Bazar Sammelani would take place. So this was the third sitting, not the first sitting. Being intrigued, being curious as to what discussions would occur there, I traveled to Kashim Bazar, where I saw Srila Prabhupada for the second time. He had come on the earnest request of Maharaj Sri Manindra Nandi that he speak Harikatha. At the time, I had not taken shelter at Srila Prabhupada's feet. I went as a common spectator. On arriving, I saw that Sri Pulin Mallik, Alaya Sri Nityananda Das, a Calcutta businessman named Sri K.B. Sen and Sri Gopindu Bandhu Vadhyay of Kalna were requesting Srila Prabhupada to give a speech about the Matrimandar in Navji. Prabhupada responded, I've come to speak Harikatha, so let me do that. Thereafter, I mostly stayed close to Prabhupada to hear his Harikatha. At the time, I observed that Prabhupada immediately offered Dandavat to everyone he met and constantly chanted Harinam on Tulsi beads. I, don't, I did not see him sleep or rest at any time. And I observed another amazing spectacle. The Maharaj of Kashim Bazar used to send huge quantities of various edibles. But Prabhupada did not take any of them, except once when he took a single tulsi leaf and gave the rest to visitors. He was there from 21 March till 24 March. I saw that he remained fasting for those four days. At this time, Prabhupada bestowed instructions saying the activities of eating, sleeping, washing, and the like are to be done far from the public eye. Even today, one can observe this behavior of Srila Prabhupada. In answer to a question of mine regarding the chant, Bhaja Nitai Gaur Radhi Shyam Japa Hare Krishna Hare Ram, Prabhupada dismissed it as a neoteric, new found. Reason, modern and imaginary rhyme, and with the reasoning based on scripture, pointed out the many types of faults of rasabhas and philosophical incorrectness inherent in it. One day in the meeting, Srila Prabhupada was invited to give a speech limited to merely five minutes. He recited Brahmanda Brahmite Kona Bhagavan Jeev and a few other verses from Sri Chaitanya Chirtamrita. And as far as possible, began a brief explanation. After not even five minutes, he was repeatedly told to sit down. From the small amount of the lecture that I heard, I felt that it was of importance and originality, impregnated with the essence of truth. I realized that the one or two unbiased, and truthful words spoken by the great person were unpalatable to a particular group of people. I then considered that perhaps that was why this illustrious soul was not taking the Maharaj's food. When later I asked him about that, he said, if no benefit can be done to anybody, or if materialists cannot be uplifted from the contamination of material objects, then by eating with them, the mind becomes polluted. 
Therefore, for all who desire actual well-being, it is necessary to perform the six kinds of association with an earnest servant of Godhead. Bhūte bhoje te chaiva is the meaning of that. Within the walls of the Maharaj of Kashim Bazar's royal palace, the place named Khosbari had been allocated as Sri Prabhupada's quarters. A gentleman from a medical family who was employed by the Maharaj was deputed for service to Prabhupada. One day he remarked to Prabhupada, you're an actual Vaishnav. All those that I see here have undeservingly consumed the Maharaj's food for they have given him no benefit. You came here to give him a real good, but his associates have not let him understand the ideal of your impartiality and Vaishnavism. This is our utmost misfortune. On 22 March, several respectable people present listened to Srila Prabhupada speak Harikatha. They included Sri Krishna Sundar Majumdar BL, a lawyer of Naukhali, Sri Rajani Kanta Vasu BL, another lawyer, and the drill master of Naukhali Jubilee School, Sri Bhupendranath Sen Gupta, BSc. Some among them asked questions relating to the genuineness of the shows of exaltation by a famous Kirtan singer. In reply, Srila Prabhupada cited a few verses from Bhaktira Samrata Sindhu to explain the differences between Shuddha Sattvika Bhava, pure spiritual ecstasy, Bhava Bhas, the shadow of ecstasy, and Kapatata, duplicity, feigned ecstasy. Apart from that, Prabhupada spoke on the Siddhanta or Shastra and Mahajanas regarding unacceptable chants and on the necessity of performing pure Mahamantra Kirtan as bestowed by Shastra and Lord Chaitanya. On 24 March, there was a scriptural discussion by Prabhupada at the residence of the Thakur, that is the Mahant of Sri Khanda, who was from the family of the Maharaj of Kashim Bazar's Guru, Sri Yukta Gaura Gunananda Thakur, Pandit Sri Yukta, Rakhal Ananda Shastri Mahashay, and many others were in attendance. When Shastri Mahashay wanted to uphold the theory of Gauranga Nagaris by quoting the word Gaurnagarva, from Sri Chaitanya Chandramrata, Prabhupada demonstrated the actual purport of Gaurnagar War in that instance, and with various types of deliberations and evidence from the Goswami literature, confuted, refuted the opinion of the Gaurnagaris. You know, this Gaurnagari group, the Gauranga Nagari group, they consider that Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu engages in various conjugal pastimes. Uh, the way Lord Krishna did uh, in his Vrindavan pastimes. Shingaur Gurananda Thakur was possibly a fish eater. When he spoke a few words supporting eating fish, Kila Prabhupada asserted the superiority of honoring Mahaprasad over that of taking vegetarian or non vegetarian comestibles, uh, food items. So, all of that. Here is a quote. Yeah, all of that is a quote from Sri Ananta Basu, who later became a disciple. <clears throat> the Sammilani assembly had been convened as a socio religious gathering for participants to bandy cordialities and mutual flattery. To uh, exhibit yeah. so that they could exchange cordial talk with mutual flattery. Now I glorify you, you glorify me. How are you? You're a great devotee. Oh, you're a great devotee. But we also do this kind of stupidity occasionally. Uh, but maverick uh, but uh, the unorthodox, independent-minded, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati had seriously disturbed the ambience, disturbed the, the environment. Although not allowed to deliver a proper public address, his mauling of the Casco Swami's informal discussion, his attack of the Casco Swami's, his uh, wounding the Casco Swami's informal discussion was sufficient warning that he had irrevocably arrived in their midst as a threat 
to their privileged experience, existence. That much having been accomplished, he decided to leave and slipped out without notifying his host. Hearing of that, Maharaj Nandi rushed to the train station to persuade Sri Siddhanta Saraswati to return. He had not been informed of the protest fast until after Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's departure. Furthermore, the Jatko Swayams had misrepresented the matter to the Maharaj, telling him that Sri Siddhanta Saraswati had refused his food because of his being from the lower caste, hilly community. Oh, then they can eat. If they are from such higher caste, why were they eating the food sent by him? Factually, it was quite the opposite. The caste Goswamis were keeping the monarch in their claws by generating fear in him regarding his theoretical lower status. Whereas, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was firmly against artificial caste discrimination. At any rate, the Maharaj was unhappy that the sadhu had been fasting in his home and had left dissatisfied. When he asked Sri Siddhanta Saraswati about that, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati explained, I got no opportunity to explicate the absolute truth according to Srimad Bhagavatam. So why should I have accepted your food? Apart from that, the Lord does not recognize offerings from a pujari blind to knowledge of the absolute. Thus, it was not prasad. So offering is not simply just putting it on the plate and chanting some mantras and so on. It has to be accepted by the Lord. This is all food for thought because this is the way Krishna reciprocates with the living entities. And Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur is simply speaking the plain truth. If apparently by eating prasadam for 20 years, 30 years, we have made no progress, it is time to rethink whether we are actually eating prasadam or not. She Siddhanta Saraswati boarded a train at 11 that night and at 2 the next morning disembarked at Dhubliya. He then wayfared five miles over the dark country tracks to Rajapattam. Reaching there at dawn, he cooked and finally broke his four-day fast. So he walked all the way from Dhulia to Rajapattam. That is probably Chaitanya Materia nowadays. A press and a preaching center. In the summer of 1912, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was appointed head of the jury in a case at Krishnagar against some dacoits, which lasted three or four days. In November, he took a group of devotees on a pilgrimage and preaching tour to holy places in West Bengal, connected with Lord Chaitanya and his associates. Around this time, Maharaj Nandi organized at Kulia another meeting of the Kashim Bazar Sammelani. On the ruler's insistence, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati attended, but again refused to take the Maharaj's food. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati explained, I have already eaten today. Moreover, I cannot honor invitations for prasad without the permission of my Gurudev. The monarch became exceedingly morose, but bidding him adieu, um, while saying goodbye to him, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati returned to the lotus feet of Srila Gaurakishore Das Babaji. On hearing of this episode, Babaji Maharaj rebuked his disciple and forbade him from further participation in such functions. He did not even want him to go to these meetings, these kind of social gatherings, which have hardly anything to do with Krishna consciousness. Pure Krishna consciousness. Devotion to Krishna can never arise at hodgepodge meetings. Even within unlimited millions of universes, it is difficult to find a devotee of Krishna. A Vaishnava is absolutely independent. Therefore, to congregate hundreds of thousands of Vaishnavas is possible solely in Lord Chaitanya's pastimes. So go to Mayapur, remain alone, and just chant Hare Krishna. Then Babaji Maharaj stuck a few bamboo poles in the ground and hung a chadar over them, declaring it a place of Vaishnava gatherings, and that an assembly of devotees had convened there and there. He chanted and danced ecstatically, which Sri Siddhanta Saraswati's vow to chant a billion names nearing completion, he ascertained, he came to the conclusion that his next task was to found a press and produce books. Many of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's writings were still unpublished, as were several important palm manuscripts in the Thakur's collection. 
But due to political disturbances caused by anti-British sentiment, it was virtually impossible to obtain authorization to establish a press in rural areas. Furthermore, it was impractical to run modern missionary in the countryside, far from technical support. Thus, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati journeyed to Calcutta with an application and requisite fees for starting a printing operation there. And while the police were processing the request, went back to Maya. Nine days later, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati returned to Calcutta and began looking in the Kaligharad suburb for a suitable property to rent. After a lengthy search, on 6 February 1913, he finally sealed a one-year lease for a stately compound at 4 Chanagar Street that included four buildings, a pond with brick surroundings and a ghat, a fountain, tennis court, an outbuilding for peacocks and deer, and a boundary wall over 20 feet high for a, for a sadhu to let an upmarket city property was unheard of. Sadhus don't come and take these kind of things on lease, on rent and all that. Yet from the beginning, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati was ready to break with stereotypes and do whatever was required for spreading the Sankirtan movement. The monthly rent of 36 rupees was but a trifle, nothing for this superb estate available so cheaply due to reputedly being haunted. Sri Siddhanta Saraswati spent most of the remainder of that year based in Kali Khan. A handful of moderately committed associates stayed with him and now and then friends and acquaintances would drop by. Every night, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati held Kirtan and distributed Harikatha to the few people who would attend. After much delay, approval for a press was granted. In April 1913, Sri Siddhanta Saraswati installed a printing machine and typesetting facilities at the Kalinghat estate and named the operation Bhagavata Jantra. Within a few months, he published part of Sri Chaitanya Chirtamrata accompanied by the Amrita Pravaha Bhashya commentary of Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur and his own Anubhashya exegesis, his own Anubhashya explanation. Bhagavad Gita, which Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur Sarat Varshini Tita in Sanskrit and Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur's Rasikranjan translation come commentary in Bengali. These ones were there. Right? Shri Krishna Chaitanya Chandra Vijayate Tamam. May Shri Krishna Chaitanya Chandra be supremely victorious. Shri Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Lila Pravishtasya, Srimad Bhaktivin of the Devasya, Anugyaya, Shri Dhamma Maya Pura Navadvipan Nivasa Kin Nivasa Kinchana, Shri Vimala Prasada Siddhanta Saraswati, Sampadita Prakashitacha. With the permission of Srimad Bhaktivinoda, who had entered into the pastimes of the Lord, published, edited, and presented and published by Sri Bhimala Prasad Siddhanta Saraswati, a renunciate living as Sri Dham Mayapur Navadvir. Sri Dham Mayapure, no, Sri Dham Mayapur Prajapattana Stite. Shri Bhagavata Yantri, Shri Yogendra Chandra Haldar Abhidena, Mudrita, was printed in the month of Keshava, 428 Chaitanya Gaurabda, by Shri Yogendra Chandra Haldar, uh, through the Shri Bhagavata Yantra at uh, Rajapattana in Shri Mayapur. It just has first, I think, verses. And then afterwards, this is Vishnu Chakravarti's commentary. He separately published a translation also. <laughs> Rasikaranjan. Did the have seen that also? 
uh, and Sri Gaura Krishna Bay, an epic poem in Sanskrit by the Oriya poet Govindadas that describes the pastimes of Lord Chaitanya. In January 1914, the lease expiry on the Kalighat property imminent, the Bhagavat Yantra was moved to Vrajapattam. That was probably reprinted at Bhagavat Yantra. Two Acharyas depart. Uh, okay, I think uh, let me make a note. And... Okay, any questions? Very interesting now. Okay, no questions. We'll resume next week with uh, what is it on the Vaibhav. If any questions come up, you can present them in Telegram. Try to work it out there. One shackle put the behavior, the person 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 the behavior